Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everyone is doing well. Welcome to Office Hours. We're very excited that you are here today with us. And we have a very special presentation about the new data set that was released last week. So I think this is going to be a wonderful and informative time for us to be together today. And so before we begin, I just wanted to introduce our speaker for today. So today we have Michael Lyons, who is joining us from the DRC. So Michael Lyons is a scientific project manager here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and he is a member of the Data and Research Center that I work with, especially on the outreach team um, for us. He received his PhD in microbiology and immunology from Stanford University, and he is interested in applying his scientific background and knowledge to the All of Us Research Program. Um, so Dr. Lyons had the opportunity to help lead the initiative of getting the, the new data set on the researcher workbench and on the research hub, and he has a plethora of knowledge to share with us today. Um, he also works on education and training tools that we help release to you as the public um, as you get used to the data set and the researcher workbench. So I am going to stop sharing and um, pass the mic on over to Michael. Thank you for the introduction, Sam. Um, I'm really excited to be here and share this with you and kind of uh, all the new data and, that we have uh, from our release, which is very exciting. And I uh, hope that everyone gets excited to work with the data and find some really, really cool things that will really help make everybody uh, and everything better. Just make some positive research out there, which will be great. Um, so yeah, let's just jump into it. Uh, kind of an overview of what I want to do today uh, and hopefully some takeaways for everybody. Um, I'm going to try to provide an overview of the new data that we have available. Uh, this was announced last week, so it's brand new. Very excited about it. Um, and then we're going to explore some of the updates on our public research hub. And then for those who aren't registered, if you are interested, uh, I'll just kind of direct you to where to go to get registered um, and kind of how to start that process off. And then from there, uh, looking going into the researcher workbench, which is our cloud computing platform, which you will actually kind of be working in in order to analyze these data and, and access the real level data. So familiarize everybody with that and how to access specifically the new data. And then from there, just sh sharing uh, our plethora of helpful resources that we have for working with the different data, working with the new data specifically, um, and making sure that everyone, uh, if you don't know exactly what to do right away, at least has the right uh, kind of way to go in a direction forward. So first of all, what is the new data? And to kind of start off, just to kind of reorient everybody on what the All of Us program is, what we're looking to do is going for at least 1 million participants across the United States and building a giant database that combines a multitude of different data sets that all have an impact on a person's health care. Um, so this is from socioeconomic status to genomic data to electronic health records. And we really want to have this being emphasized on uh, kind of overrepresenting historically underrepresented communities. So we're trying to build a database that's different than all the other historical databases in both size and who our participants are. So we're really, really excited that with our latest release, we passed that 400,000 participant mark. So we're at 413,450 plus participants that have curated data that is available for researchers to jump into that research workbench and work with. And about 75% are from communities of historically underrepresented in biomedical research. So a very diverse population and 43% of that is specifically from racial and ethnic minority groups. So it's a data set that we're very, very proud of that's very different, that is very unique, that uh, will offer a really great resource for researchers that we're very excited about. Obviously, we could not do this, especially uh, like reaching out to these historically underrepresented communities without a lot of partnership uh, with different participants uh, and, and different uh, organizations. So I'd like to first give a thanks to all those uh, uh, groups that are helping us with this effort. In addition to just reaching out to participants and getting participants enrolled, we also have a lot of uh, people and organizations within our consortium that then go on and work with the data and get this data in a state that researchers can work with. Um, I'm, as Sam mentioned, with Vanderbilt University, which is a data research center right at the very bottom middle there uh, with several other organizations, but there's a lot that goes on to make this possible, and we want to thank everybody that's active, and also thank the researchers that are doing some really cool stuff with this data. So now moving on to what's kind of happened in the past and where we are going forward, 
I just want to orient. Um, and just four years ago in 2019 is when we launched our kind of what's available to the public, our data browser. And then when you're actually starting to work with data and work with analyzing real level data is where Researcher Workbench came out in 2020. Uh, from there, we've been slowly expanding. Uh, we're not, not slowly, actually pretty rapidly expanding what we have available to researchers um, and what data types, the amount of participants. And just over a year ago in March 2022, we launched our genomics uh, kind of arm of things. So that's when genomic data became available. In 2023 and beyond, uh, starting last week, is when we kind of continue to expand what data types are available, uh, the participant numbers. So we are constantly looking to expand what we provide, uh, the amount of data that we have. So we're always trying to get feedback as well. If there's data that we don't have yet that you are particularly interested in and think that would be a great resource that's impactful to uh, personal health, let us know. We're always looking for feedback and looking to expand and grow, um, which is very, very exciting. So essentially the way that we expand and grow is that we have different data releases. So this CDR uh, uh, currently that we just released was version seven. And essentially what happens is that we collect all of the data. So on the far left, we have participant surveys, which are self-filled out, linked electronic health records, physical measurements, uh, Fitbit data and biospecimens where we get our genomic data. We uh, in the Data Research Center curate all of that data from the raw data, make a curated data repository or CDR, and then that's what goes out onto the researcher workbench that you can then access and use that curated data for your research. So as I mentioned, this is a seventh uh, iteration of this. And what we previously had in our version six is that we had uh, almost 375,000 survey responses uh, as well as uh, hundreds of thousands of electronic records, physical measurements, and Fitbit, with a little bit under 100,000 whole genome sequences and a little bit over 150,000 genotyping arrays. So we had a lot of data already, but we're very happy to say that we have expanded that data as well. Um, if we look specifically first at the phenotypic data, um, almost all of the groups are uh, different uh, types of data. We've had about a 10% increase in participant counts across all of these data with a number of uh, new data that we can look into and specifically. Uh, for example, there's new sleep data now for our Fitbit counts, and we also have uh, survey data um, updates as well. Uh, so if we actually look at what we have available for survey data, uh, again, these are surveys that participants self-fill out. So these are things uh, that cover different aspects of their lives, so basics, overall health, lifestyle, healthcare access and utilization, we have uh, updated the personal health history and family medical history into a single survey. Uh, so that is something that we have a little bit new. Uh, we also have the social determinants of health, uh, COVID-19 participant experience survey, and then a new survey, which is our COVID-19 vaccines minute survey. Uh, and then this is kind of the final COVID-19 uh, related survey data that we're going to have. So that kind of caps all of that off. So we have a couple of updated surveys and new surveys to look at. Uh, if we look now to the other type of phenotypic data that's brand new, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> uh, going over the uh, surveys themselves, what we did to update them, uh, we, you can see here, uh, we've replaced the individual uh, personal medical health history uh, and the family health history into one survey, as I mentioned. <clears throat> And data from all these three surveys are within the CDR. Uh, so we just kind of updated that slightly. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, new year 2022 minute survey on COVID-19 vaccines is that final survey released about COVID-19. So that kind of caps that all off. If we look now at our Fitbit sleep data, this is a new type of data for Fitbit. Uh, so this is where you can see the different type of sleep and total number uh, hours of sleep that participants are getting. Uh, we have a lot of different participants that have this uh, type of data, which is great. Uh, so you can see on the right side, uh, almost 14,000 of our 15.6 uh, thousand participants with Fitbit data have all these different types of Fitbit data combined. Uh, if we actually look at these different types of Fitbit, Fitbit data, we have the activity, heart rate, minute level, heart rate, uh, and then sleep data, sleep level, and steps. So we have almost 14,000 uh, participants that have all of these data combined. And you can also see here that this is a pretty longitudinal data set uh, with an average about 
five years of, of data for each of these different data types. So it's a great data set if you're interested in looking at the Fitbit and getting a kind of uh, idea of that. We now have sleep to complement the other uh, types of data that we have for that as well. Where the real, real major additions for this uh, most recent CDR is, is really in the genomic data. Uh, as you can see, where we had about 10% increase in participant data for the phenotypic uh, data types, we almost doubled in both uh, whole genome sequences, which now is almost a quarter of a million uh, whole genome sequences, um, as well as our genotyping arrays, which is well over 300,000 uh, participants that have genotyping arrays. Uh, we also introduced a couple of new different types of uh, genomic data that are, is now available to researchers to work with. Uh, so we have over 11,000 structural variant data sets for participants, um, as well as a uh, set of 1,000 plus long read genome sequences. Uh, so that's an another new uh, uh, sequencing type that we're really excited to share with everybody. Um, additionally, uh, we're happy to say that with this release, there's also uh, Cromwell has been added as a tool to work with this genomic data. Uh, so if you're familiar with Cromwell and, and working with that, uh, you now have that as a tool to work with inside the researcher workbench. Uh, if we actually look a little bit more into this, uh, what the long read sequences are, if you're unfamiliar with them, uh, what we have the major, uh, big, almost two, 245,000 plus whole genome sequences are done with short reads. Uh, long reads is essentially just longer uh, uh, sequencing reads, and this gives a more complete uh, look at the genome to make sure that we're not missing any sequencing gaps uh, and gives us more confidence in that. Uh, where this really shines is looking at and uh, identifying structural variants within the geno genomic sequences. Um, so you can see from this uh, uh, work that was done here, uh, highlighted in the box at the bottom right, uh, long reads discovered about 25,000 uh, structural variants per genome as compared to short read sequencing, which discovered about 10,000 structural variants per genome. Uh, so it's a new kind of data type that we're really, really excited to be able to share. Um, specifically, this uh, 1,000 participants is all of an African ancestry. So it's also a very unique and interesting uh, uh, data set as well in that in that regard too. Uh, so we're very excited to share that with everybody. If we actually look at our structural variant data, um, what structural variants are, if you're unfamiliar, uh, these are specific types of uh, mutations that can arise. So things like insertions, deletions, duplications, inversions, as well as complex events. Uh, so all this data is av available for researchers to look at within that 11,000 uh, subsection of the whole genome sequences. Um, so we're very excited to be able to kind of get that out to everybody as well. Uh, as I mentioned, Cromwell is now uh, a new tool that uh, researchers can work with. Uh, it's particularly helpful in working with genomic data. Um, so this is essentially a workflow organizer, so something that you can use to string together a series of complex operations. Uh, it works in, in the uh, Whittle language, uh, so it's really great. There's a bunch of pipelines that are available that you can look at and, and use, um, and it's kind of uh, there's a lot of experience uh, working in the Terra environment, which is essentially what our researcher workbench uh, environment is in. So you can definitely use this now and hopefully it'll be very helpful for, for uh, people to work with. Uh, in addition to all of those new data types, we also have made it hopefully a little bit easier for researchers to work with reduced genomic call sets that are popular. Um, so hopefully working only with what you need and you don't have to kind of go in and make this yourself. Um, so we have a couple of reduced call sets, uh, such as our allele count, allele frequency threshold call sets, our exomes only call set, and then our, our ClinVar variance call set. Um, so this is not, uh, the ClinVar variance call set is not reduced to just pathogenic or non-pathogenic, uh, but it is variants that are kind of labeled in ClinVar. Um, so if you want to work with specifically one of these types of data sets, that is available to you and it's a little bit easier than previously uh, what was available before. You don't have to do it yourself now. Uh, so where this data really shines is being able to combine both the phenotypic data that I mentioned previously and the genotypic data that I was just going over. Uh, so we're very excited to be able to say that uh, for participants that have whole genome sequences, electronic health records, physical measurements, and surveys all together, we have over 200,000 participants that have all that data linked 
um, that researchers can go with, go forward with, work with, and it's very, very exciting. So uh, there's a lot to work with, uh, big updates from, <laughs> from our previous data set where this was a much smaller number, and it, it's really great to have a holistic view of participant data and, and, and working with that going forward. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, one of the key parts of the All of Us data set is the diversity of the participants that we have. Uh, so we're very excited to say that uh, 74, over 74 percent, almost three fourths of our participants have at least one UBR, which is underrepresented in biomedical research category. And you can see that how these are broken down below. Um, so we have uh, our participants are about 43 percent from a non-white race or Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Uh, almost a quarter are of an age over 65. 9% have less than a high school degree for education. A quarter of them are have an annual income of under 25,000. 10% are of sexual and gender minorities. 7% are rural locations and 10% have a disability. Um, so we're very excited about this population and, and participants that we have uh, to really give a uh, unique and different uh, data set uh, to researchers to look forward to and, and work with that will then progress healthcare forward for uh, populations that historically haven't been addressed as much. And we're also very excited to say that kind of with this diversity and with our most recent launch, um, all of us has the world's largest and most diverse genomic data set of its kind, which is very, very exciting uh, for us and hopefully also exciting for researchers uh, to jump into and, and work with all this data that we have. Um, so now we'll actually go into how do I work with this data. Um, so first of all, I want to kind of give an overview of the different types of uh, how we display data for people. Uh, so there are different tiers that we have set up um, in order to both share widely and wisely with different perspective uh, researchers. Uh, so our most basic tier at the very bottom is our public tier. Um, so this has summary statistics, aggregate counts, and this is on our public website, uh, our data browser, to actually work with the individual data, the road level data, and to access the sequences. If you're interested in genomics, uh, then you have to become a registered user, um, and that will get you access to the registered tier and control tier. Uh, which is kind of seen in those middle two tiers. And then that data will actually be not on the data browser, but on the researcher workbench, which we'll kind of look into in, in a little bit. Uh, the, the differences between the registered tier and the control tier is that the control tier has slightly more uh, sensitive uh, information and data types. So if you're interested in genomics, uh, those genomic sequences are only available on the control tier. Um, additionally, uh, dates are shifted uh, within one year on the registered tier uh, for events, and they are in the exact uh, dates in the control tier. Uh, the only difference for accessing these uh, is that you have to have a control tier uh, agreement with your institution and all of this program for uh, accessing the control tier. And there is a little bit more training for the control tier just to make sure that uh, you understand our data policies and, and, and security policies. Uh, but besides that, uh, it's, it's a very simple and straightforward kind of ability to jump into the control tier. So first, I want to bring us to updates that we have on our research hub. So our research hub is a great resource to look at what data that we have. If you're interested in doing a project, we have a giant data set, but it's not all encompassing. So this is a great place to go and look at our data, overall summary statistics, and see if what you're interested in, we have that data. So I'm actually going to jump off the slideshow and move us over to the research hub itself. So I can kind of show you how to navigate this and, and, and see the new things. Um, so what I want to bring attention to first is that if you are interested in kind of following along where the All of Us Research Program is, you can actually go to this data snapshots page um, and you can see how we've done for enrolling participants, uh, uh, linking electronic health records and providing biospecimen samples. Um, this number obviously is much bigger than the 400,000 that I've mentioned previously. This is for all of our participants, including non-curated uh, data for the participants. So we will get to this point for you to be able to work with that data, uh, but we are still working on curating data. And we'll, we plan to have data releases about once a year. Um, so in a year or more, uh, more or less, be looking for another kind of release from us with another big batch of new participants and data to look forward to. 
Uh, but if we want to look at what's new, let's go to the data browser. Um, so as I mentioned, the data browser is essentially a great place to look at what data we have and look at summary counts and statistics. Um, so here you will be able to find that we have all of our different uh, data types laid out. So as I mentioned, we have electronic health records data, and within those domains, we have conditions, drug exposures, lab measurements, and procedures. Uh, we have our genomics section uh, where you can search for specific variants. Uh, so as you can see, we have over 245,000 whole genome sequences with over 1 billion SNP indel variants. Uh, we currently do not have uh, a uh, browser for structural variants. We are working on that. So hopefully in the near-ish future, we'll be able to put that up. Uh, but that is currently, you're only able to look at SNP and Dell variant searches for right now. Uh, we have measures and wearables, measurements and wearables. So these are physical measurements that are recorded, uh, our Fitbit data, um, as well as at the bottom are different surveys. So you can look at the different survey questions and, and, and the different surveys and participant counts that we have for each individual survey. Uh, so the way that this kind of, you can go through here um, is if there's a specific type of uh, or disease or lab measurement that you're interested in. Uh, for this case, let's just say diabetes. You can type in a keyword and it will pop up with the different data uh, uh, associated with it. Um, so as expected, there's uh, EHR conditions with the keyword diabetes, different labs and measurements, procedures, as well as a survey, uh, survey that is related to diabetes. Uh, so we can actually look at the different conditions and then we kind of get an overview starting with top 10 conditions uh, and you can get the participant counts here. We can also scroll down and get a, kind of a general overview if we are interested in type 2 diabetes of the demographic a breakdown of a specific condition. Uh, so we can look at sex, uh, female versus male and age as well. Um, so this is kind of just a really great resource to see what we have, what's available. Um, and if we go back to the data browser, if we're interested in a specific variant uh, for genomics, that works a little bit differently. And this is actually what's kind of new-ish, which is very exciting. Uh, so this is the same. Uh, you can What you can do is you can search by a number of different ways. You can look for a specific variant. Uh, you can look at genomic region, RS number, or gene name. Uh, so if we're interested in specifically a, a gene associated with uh, diabetes in a particular uh, 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 group of people, we can put in APOL1, and we can see what comes up when we put that in. So now we have search by a gene, uh, and we have all these different variants, and we get the different protein changes, ClinVar significance, allele counts. Uh, what's really cool here is that you can actually now filter and sort, uh, and we can look at the different genes. So if we had other ones, we can sort that way. We can also look at consequences such as uh, uh, what's happening in the gene itself, as well as ClinVar significance, allele counts, allele number, allele frequency. Uh, so if we we're specifically interested in ClinVar uh, kind of confirmed pathogenic variants of APOL1, we can search by that, which will bring us down here. Um, which is a very, very useful feature and, and I think really, really cool. Um, so now we can look specifically at these previously uh, uh, confirmed pathogenic variants and see what the allele counts and uh, demographics are for those as well if we kind of go underneath here. Uh, so all this is on the data browser. So there's really cool things that are available just if you're not even a registered user. If you do want to become a registered user and we you see, hey, there's a lot of data that I'm interested in working with, you can kind of click on this register link and it will bring you to kind of our six step process for actually becoming a registered user. Um, so first you kind of just need to look, make sure that it's there, then go into a, get a data use agreement, make sure that your institution has one, and then you can go on, do complete a little bit of training. It takes about an hour or two to do all the training, and then you can jump into the researcher workbench and work with the data. Okay, here we go. Let's go back. Okay, I believe that my screen is back up. So now what we're on is our version seven of our newest CDR. Uh, so if you want to access the newest CDR, it will naturally kind of put you in that when you make a new workspace. Uh, but just in case it doesn't, just double check that you are working in the uh, data set 
version seven. So that will get you the newest data set. From here, we can kind of uh, look at the different data that we have. So if we actually are using a uh, version seven data, we can actually look at different cohorts. Uh, so we can now uh, uh, to make build cohorts based on long read whole genome sequences, short read versus short read whole genome sequences, as well as structural variant data. Um, if we want to do Fitbit, we can have the Fitbit, and then that will we'll be able to get our sleep data from that way. Uh, we can also look at uh, our survey data. So now we have uh, the vaccine survey, uh, which is that new survey, and our per personal and family health history survey as well. Another thing I want to point out is that here on the far right is where you can see the Cromwell cloud environment. Um, so if we start this back up, um, if you want to have a Cromwell uh, cloud environment going, you click on this icon here and then scroll down to hit start, and then you will have your Cromwell environment as well going. Um, and then if you want to link, oh, do not want to save that. Uh, if you want to link your environments, your Jupyter notebook and your Cromwell, it might take a second to do that, uh, to load this up then you can use different code snippets and that will uh, link them uh, and I'll show you just kind of where to find that very quickly but a lot of this is detailed out in our different um, uh, support materials on the support hub which I will show you um, in a second to make sure that you know where to go after this uh, presentation um, if you have any any trouble. Um, while this is loading up, I want to bring attention. Uh, we have our featured workspaces. If you're familiar with those, these are essentially uh, tutorial notebooks and blueprints for working with different data types. So these have all been updated to have version seven uh, kind of updates. So you can go there to see how to work with the data in the newest version, uh, which, it, which is really, really helpful. And then, as I mentioned, if you are interested in working with specific types of data, we have a lot of different uh, support materials on our user support hub. So here is kind of the link for that. You can also get there through our public website if you want to look at that as well. Um, here we go. Now it's loading up, but I highly recommend going to our uh, user support hub as well. We also have a wonderful support staff uh, for those who are kind of frequent uh, comers to our office hours should know. They know what they're doing, they're great, and we're always happy to answer questions. Uh, so here you can go to snippets, and then this is where you can see all of us Cromwell set up snippets. So from here, you can kind of link your Cromwell environment with your Jupyter notebook environment. Um, and then all working with it is much more detailed out, but I just want to show how to get started there and, and, and moving from there. So if we actually kind of go back to our home page, that's kind of how you access a lot of the different new data types. Uh, and work with our new tool, which is very exciting. Um, and then if we go to our user support hub, you'll be able to see um, a lot of our different uh, work with data, videos, anything that you're interested in. Uh, you can go here and we have all these articles set up and, uh, that would be interesting for the new data sets. Um, so we have our different quality reports that have been updated to reflect our new data sets. Um, how you use Cromwell. Uh, so anything that is new that you want to kind of engage with but aren't sure how, come to the support hub. We will have articles here for you to help you. And if it's not there, if you're still confused and uh, we don't have something, please let us know. Reach out to us. We always want to know what we can do better, um, how we can make this better for researchers um, and make it a better experience overall. Um, so with that, I I'm going to stop and open up for questions. And thank you everybody for listening. And I hope that uh, everyone is excited to jump in there and, and do some awesome research. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a wonderful comprehensive overview of all the wonderful things that um, we have added to the data set. So if you have questions, um, we have a lot going on in the chat. Thank you guys for your questions. We really appreciate them. Um, but feel free to come off mute and ask or um, put them in the chat and I'll try to to moderate those questions as well. I think Andrea was asking about the BGen files um, for version seven, is that correct? Um, we have some information on those featured workspaces, so if you need to create those new ones for the new version, you can. And then someone asked about new user orientation, it'll be next week on Friday at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time with me. So you guys have seen a lot of me lately, so I'm very excited. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Sam. Mm -hmm. Feel free to come off mute if you have questions. This is a wonderful time that Michael is here and I am here to answer them. I'm also joined by some of my colleagues from the DRC who, as Michael mentioned, have such a plethora of knowledge. Um, we have some of our data science uh, team members here and some of our help desk team members here. So if you do have a question, um, feel free to put about the data set, about the new version, about the new functionality, um, feel free to, to put it. Uh, can the cohort build or choose participants by whether they carry a certain variant on certain genes? So we do have, and Michael went through that, we do have certain features that let you look at the long read and short read, which you'll need to go into the data set to look at variant information. But you can search it again, like you said, in the data browser. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that. Um, and just as uh, if there are things that you know about the, the variant, like if it's in an exome, you can look at the uh, exome shorter data set that we have. So you don't necessarily have to download everything. Uh, so the more you know about the variant, the better that you can try and maybe work with our more condensed genomic data sets. Um, but unfortunately, you cannot uh, look specifically and build a cohort by a variant or gene at this time. Thank you. I think we just had a question about the back effects between release versions. So I'm going to actually link a office hours we had on Tuesday because um, Lee Lichtenstein, who um, is at the Broad Institute and one of our lead curation um, team members and directors for the genomic data, actually addressed that specific question, um, which is a great, great question. And then we also have the QC quality report if you want to dive into it. I will note for those who have been with us for a while, the QC report for genomics is uh, a little bit longer <laughs> than it was the last time. So um, just take some time to read through it. We tried to organize it in a way that you guys could, could find the information that you needed um, and the feedback that we've been getting through help desk tickets. So we appreciate all that you guys have asked um, as it contributes to the way that we, we do the data set. Uh, how do we access commonly used tools for genomic analysis links for Genie? A very similar process as the last version. So again, you can see all that information in those featured workspaces as well. There's another great question. So if anyone wants to answer it um, regarding EHR, approximately how long in years is the follow-up um, in the updated data. There was a similar nice graph for the Fitbit data. I don't know if anyone uh, from the DRC would like to answer that in terms of the time frame. So I, I can take a stab at that. Um, it, it varies. It varies quite a bit um, for EHR. It's not quite as nice as that Fitbit data where there's a nice kind of uh, median of five years or so, and it's kind of all within a, a small uh, kind of uh, section of years, it, it, it varies quite a bit from 10 plus years to less than a year or, or a year or so. Um, so that is, there's not really a good answer for a nice tight median or average, unfortunately. Yeah. And I would just like to add one more thing is when you work on EHR data, think of like, like if you're looking for condition data, which domain are you interested in? We do have longitudinal EHR data, but again, the value would vary based on which EHR domain you are interested in. And, but the, the EHR data is longitudinal. Which goes into the next question a user asked about transitioning from version six to version seven. Um, yes, the person IDs do stay the same. Um, and then yes, if that individual has updated EHR data that is added with their person ID um, as well, or if there's new participants who are adding to the data set then they will have their own new separate person ID. Um, as we continue to add. So that's where, uh, you know, Dr. Masters or Haral was saying that longitudinal um, opportunity allows them to cross the data set. I don't know if you had anything else to add to that, Haral. Oops. Are there funding opportunities available on the analysis for analysis and researcher workbench outside of the initial credit? Um, so the NIH does have a funding page that often has rotating funding opportunities, some specific to the AOU program or specific to a uh, specific project type um, or um, you know, uh, areas of interest. Um, so I will put the link in just a second on how to look at those funding opportunities. How do you recommend we track follow-up for patients? Is there a code that is specifically for follow-up visits to track median follow-up? Um, this is just how I have personally does it. I just look at the, vis the visit start and end dates and I kind of look at them over time myself. Um, so I just pull all of that from each um, OMOP table to look at if they had a visit at this time versus this time, and I denote follow-up from there. Um, Brandy, if you came off, so go ahead. 
Yeah, I think one thing we can put in the chat, uh, the chat for this is a great resource is our program's operational protocol. So it's really important just to understand when a participant consents, what they're consenting to. They're consenting to being invited to complete any activity, but none except for our basic survey is required. So you'll see participants who might have uh, survey data plus genomics data, but maybe not all. In terms of an actual enrollment visit with the program, at this point, participants complete one near that. It's an initial visit that happens um, pretty soon after consent. And we're exploring other ways to do reassessments or follow-ups, but that's still in process. Thank you, Brandy. I think there was a question on the future availability of biospecimens. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, that is an ongoing discussion and we will update you um, via our research hub when we have more information available. Hey Vivian, could you walk us through the process of making updates to the existing survey questions, um, the personnel? Um, go ahead, Brady. Yeah, hi Vivian. So what, what this what has happened with this release is we have incorporated a new version of that survey that's currently being fielded to participants. So previously participants were asked to complete two separate surveys to capture the same information. They were asked to complete a personal medical history survey to um, self-report their own diagnoses and then a family health history survey to report on diagnoses among their family members. Um, the program realized that that was a bit of a burden for participants to be asked the same information in two separate ways. So they streamlined that by merging all of those same items into a single combined personal and family health history survey. Um, so within the release, you have the option to explore all data from all three survey versions together. You can see that normalized view of the data if you're using our tool. So if you're using the data set builder and you import that into your notebook, you're automatically getting all three of those versions combined into one. Um, you can also continue to use the observation table, OMOP, to look at those data um, as individual versions, but the items that are captured in those surveys are carried forward into the new version itself. And we are really excited to see how uh, researchers use this data. So using the tools versus using the observation table. So Vivian, if you have any other questions or you get started and you have some feedback, um, we'd love to hear that as well. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, so just wanted to clarify the last point you had. Um, so I use partly, I use both cohort builders and SQL. And I noticed that by, in, um, by recreating um, my old version six workspace into version seven, um, the codes I had for for these personal medical history, like it, it looked like there were some missing data. And I think you um, that has to do with the version, the three different versions that you mentioned. So I, I just want to clarify that if I use SQL to call out um, the individual medical person, past medical history, let's say um, if one, if I have ever had um, diabetes um, with self-checked, does that mean that to in order to get every, all the participants that responded to that question starting 2017, I will need to include concept, concept IDs from all three versions? I think it's going to take me a minute to really think about your question, but my immediate reaction is no. Um, because one thing that we did to also support modeling of this data outside of normalizing it in the tools is that we actually remapped and coded it within the OMOP PPI vocabulary. So in our featured workspace, so within the all of us how to work with survey data featured workspace, there is a new personal and family health history notebook. There's an appendix section of that notebook that touches on this. So for example, one thing you, you're not able to do with the tools through the survey structure itself is say you wanna see um, a list of all participants who have been, or, or you wanna see an individual participant's list of conditions. Um, you should be able to work with that data without having to specify each individual version. 
but I feel like I need to think about your question a little bit more to be sure I'm giving you an accurate response. Um, so in the meantime, if you would check out that workspace and see if that answers it, and if not, if you would follow up with our help desk, I will do some investigation on my side as well. Yeah, I Vivian, think um, I will continue yeah, with have, that okay. email thread um, that Sam was corresponding to me. Um, yeah. I appreciate this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Vivian, I am actively looking at that ticket. So you'll hear from me today or early next week, hopefully. But thank you for your questions. It really is helpful. Any other questions that I missed? For building a cohort in version seven, I'm not sure why I'm not seeing the whole genome sequence or global diversity rate options exist that previously existed. Um, is the team planning to add this? We made some changes as Michael just went over um, when you are using genomic data and the point and click tools available to utilize the current data set for genomics in the way that it's supposed to look. So any feedback, Michael? Um, I was just going to say, um, yeah, the whole genome sequence is now broken down into yeah, short read and long well. read. Um, and the other thing, if you're not seeing either of those, I would double check that you are not in the registered tier um, and that it is in the control tier uh, workspace, which it looks like Chris also asked and it, you said yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, it should be showing up. Uh, there should be uh, short read uh, and long read whole genome sequences, as well as global diversity arrays as well, and the structural variants um, that you should be able to build out in the cohort builder. Um, so if it's not showing, I'm not sure why it's not. I'm looking now and I can see it. So if you are still not seeing it, just uh, send us a support ticket and we'll be able to look at that as well. And I'm looking at both version seven and version six and I can see both. So let us know if you still have any issues. See you, Vivian. I think she had to leave. Um, okay, I'll take a few more of your questions. For building concept sets, did you use Nomad Coder, ICD-9, 10, or both? That's a great question. Um, and I will leave it up to you as a discussion as the researcher. Um, we model our data set um, with the OMOC common data model. And so the Nomad Code um, are a really great way to encompass all the data set and the concepts that we have available. Um, we do know that some researchers have projects that have specific items that they need to see in the ICD 9 or 10. So there is a toggle that you can go back and forth um, between, but we will leave that up to you as a researcher. And to confirm my understanding of the smaller call set, the new version of the short read whole genome sequences is now available in plain form with variant filter for population allele frequency. Yes, and you can read all of that information and how the genomic data is organized. Um, and you can look at the controlled CDR for genomics to pull those file paths and the specific cell formats that we have or call formats that we have. Um, is the long range whole genome uh, sequence data seems to be only individual of African ancestry primarily? Is there a specific reason for that? Um, Lee kind of talked a little bit about ancestry in his office hours on Tuesday. And then you'll see more um, about that in the QC quality report. I know I feel bad. I'm giving you guys a lot of reading material, but it'll probably be faster and easier for you to digest because it's a lot. Um, and that's a great question. If you have specific feedback on Ancestry um, for that you're looking for, feel free to send us a help desk ticket at supportresearchallofus.org. Um, Lee mentioned in his office hours, we do actually take your feedback on things that you would like to see in the data set. So if there's specific things that you want to see that you that aren't currently there, um, please give us that feedback. Um, the concept set contains source concepts, ICD-9, that may be present in multiple domains. Okay, so when you are um, creating concepts in the researcher workbench, you have the option to use those concepts in two different, uh, two different vocabulary the standard vocabulary, or the you can use the source code. We typically model the OMOT common data model. Our concepts are in the standard vocabulary, and that's where you'll see SNOMED code. So if you are looking at EHR domain condition, or you're looking at um, lab measurements, et cetera, you can, you can see them in the standard vocabulary. If you don't want to look at it in that way, and you want to look at it in source, you can toggle it back to source um, if you want to. And I will actually go into this a lot more next week in the user orientation. And if you have additional questions and you wanna share your screen, please join me on Tuesday for our office hours. And then we'll be able to hopefully walk you through how to, to model those concepts. Um, 
Um, uh, hi, hi, Uma. Yes, I think you emailed about the, the cloud using the container, um, Docker containers. Um, we are going to need to follow up with that in a help desk ticket because that has been on a case by case basis. Any other questions, feel free to come off mute. I love your questions. These are very helpful for our team. Um, and if anyone from the DRC, let me know if I missed anything in the chat. Okay. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you um, to our colleagues at the DRC. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Haral, um, and the rest of the team for giving us all this information for our users. If you have additional questions outside of office hours today, feel free to email us at support at researchalloofus.org. Um, we will also be hosting Tuesday drop-in office hours next week for registered users of the researcher workbench. And then we will also be having new user orientation um, describing more about the new data set in ways that you can get started in the researcher workbench. So we appreciate you guys taking the time to spend with us today. Um, I will hang out for another minute or two for extra questions. But other than that, we will see you next time.